Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we are talking Taiwan's energy and Taiwan's energy security problem. Taiwan sits center stage in global politics. Its production of semiconductors via TSMC is crucial to global supply chains. Yet at the moment, Taiwan faces an energy security challenge. Grid management and periodic blackouts are threatening its industry. It also faces the threat of blockade from China. The history of Taiwan's power is also a microcosm of trends and events that have been going on globally. Its push for renewables in the mid-2010s to replace nuclear power has solved neither decarbonization nor energy security. In this episode, we discuss how Taiwan got to where it is, what it means for the upcoming election, and what it means for global security and global industry, and what lessons can be learned. Our guest is Angelica Ong. Angelica is an independent energy reporter and analyst who's focused her career on Taiwan. As always, and to help us continue to get great guests, please do leave a positive review on the platform you're listening on. Click the five stars on Apple or on Spotify, or ideally leave a written review. And we also really rely on word of mouth, so please do share this with your colleagues. It really does support the show and allow us to continue to put out great episodes. And finally, I hope you enjoy the episode. Angelica, welcome to the show. Hi, Paul. I'm a big fan of your podcast, actually, so I'm so pleased to be here. Very kind. Well, so we're talking about Taiwan's energy and its energy security problem, which is also a problem for uh, the world as well, as we'll get into. Can you just help get us all on the same page about Taiwan's political, geopolitical status today and give us a bit of the background so that we understand the relevance of this topic? Well, uh, Taiwan is in a very unique situation of um, being a country that's not a country. We're not in the United Nations, not ever since uh, we left uh, when the big China joined. (laughs) Basically, when Chiang Kai-shek lost the uh, civil war in the wake of World War II, they decamped to to Taiwan and uh, basically claimed to rule be the legitimate ruler of all of China from this little island. Now, obviously, there was a disconnect with reality here. But uh, right now, when I go um, go abroad, my passport still says Republic of China. But and we all know, and it also says it there as well. It's it's Taiwan. It's a little island on the eastern side of China, and um, China still claims Taiwan as a part of its territory. Yeah, which has a a little island, but a very consequential one, especially for the world's semiconductor business, well, the world's economy. And, you know, I think there's a general understanding, certainly amongst this audience, of the the one China policy. There's obviously an election coming up in in January of this year, which is all over the world. Yeah, we can talk about the election. Yeah, which is all over the world's Mm -hmm. media, and it's going to be consequential to energy policy. There's one piece of the puzzle just to get in there. We've just done an episode with Chris Miller on chip war and the centrality of semiconductors, in particular TSMC, to the Taiwanese economy and to the world's economy, a, a huge concentration, some 90% of the latest chips are made there. That that plays into this geopolitical story as well. Can you just help us understand TSMC and, and how central semiconductors are to Taiwan and this notion of the silicon shield? Well, I can give you some statistics that maybe situate all of the listeners to the role of TSMC in Taiwan. When President Tsai Ing-wen took office in 2016, TSMC was already using almost 4% of Taiwan's entire grid. And uh, it's only started using more and more ever since because as the chips become more high performance and the processes get smaller, the power use goes up exponentially. By 2022, that has uh, almost doubled to uh, 7.5% of our grid. So for every 100 kilowatt hours used in Taiwan, uh, 7.5 went to TSMC, probably making the chips that 
you're using in your phone that we're probably using to record this conversation right now. Bloomberg even has a prediction that by 2025, that percentage will be raised to 12.5% of Taiwan's entire grid will go to one company to make one product. Uh, well, many kinds of different chips. But as we learned from Chris Miller, were TSMC to even have a sustained outage as a result of, of power loss, the consequence for the global supply chain is absolutely enormous. We no longer live in a world where there's just one chip in each item. There are many hundreds of chips in some of the most advanced technology and cars have multiple chips. And as we saw in the pandemic, which was just simply the wrong chips getting made as opposed to a cessation of a production, the impact was immediate and profound, you know, cars waiting on lots for months at an end and so forth. So that that gives rise to this idea that the silicon shield. Can you t tell us tell us about that? Yeah, it, it was a very, very interesting time. Actually, I was covering the Ministry of Economic Affairs as a reporter at that time. And what had happened was TSMC actually warned the automakers that if they cancel their orders, which they did during the pandemic because they weren't anticipating the strong rebound in demand, that they were going to lose their place and you, they simply cannot, they'll, they'll have to get to the back of the line again. And it was incredible because we, the Minister of Economic Affairs was fielding very high level calls, not just from companies, but from governments all over the world, from Germany, from the US, basically begging her to see if their automakers can get some preference. So it's a very clear demonstration of how, because we, we basically have the best chips in the world, we play a crucial part of the world's supply chains. And were Taiwan, to, were that production to cease via energy, as we're talking here, or, you know, unthinkably war, there's an idea that you just can't risk, you know, the US protects Taiwan, in part because of its centrality to the economy. I know that's a very sort of cynical Bismarckian way of thinking about it, but that, you know, there you go. But also there's this idea as well that an invasion of Taiwan would be very deleterious to the world's economy and to China itself were it to, to disrupt TSMC and other crucial, we should also say other crucial technologies and fabrication that goes on there. TSMC is a singular company in the world but I do want to clear something up because sometimes people think, well, China might invade Taiwan for TSMC. And I just want to make it very clear that TSMC will not be of value to the Chinese because it relies on a super complicated supply chain, which means that it will no longer be able to function without, let's say, ASML, which is the producer of equipment. And it's it's from Europe. So what it will do if TSMC is knocked out is there will be a huge dis disruption in the most um, high quality, most powerful chips in the world. I believe the second in the world would be Korea Samsung, but it will take them a while to um, catch up. And I also want to emphasize that even though TSMC is, is a key company, a very important company, and um, very important power hungry company that Taiwan is just strategically important just by dint of its location. It's a part of what they call the first island chain. And um, the strategic importance of Taiwan is quite separate from um, the, the additional importance of the fact that it holds TSMC. Long before it was noticed, perhaps back when TSMC wasn't holding such a pivotal role, the U.S. had already highly, highly valued Taiwan. And uh, re both, both, I think, that the Chinese and the Americans, they highly, highly recognize Taiwan's strategic position for China's possible force projection. So if China does end up invading and holding Taiwan, it would be an unsinkable aircraft carrier. And um, it would 
enable China to project forth much further, much in, in a much cleaner way. And everybody in the neighborhood, including Japan, would fall under its sphere of influence. Yeah, well, I think we've set the stakes up. Uh, well, you've set the stakes up very well there. Okay, so let's let's talk about the energy component, the, the, the major emphasis of this episode. So before we talk about the sort of the security in the mix today, and there's lots, there's what I find so fascinating about this story is that there's sort of, it's almost like the energy transition in microcosm as all of the forces of politics, positioning, resources come into play. And, and there's some stark lessons there. But let's start off with sort of a bit of the history. Can you sort of give us a setup of Taiwan's initial power mix and kind of the, the I think what's crucial to the story is their, their nuclear policy history? Well, um, before Taiwan became the Taiwan of TSMC, Taiwan was the place where cheap umbrellas, Barbie dolls and tennis shoes were made. Back then, we literally, we would be saying the 60s and 70s, we have factories sprouting out of the paddy fields. And buyers from Sears would come here and uh, try and secure long furniture contracts. It was under these conditions, actually, that we, we started our nuclear industry. We decided that um, it was necessary because we, we knew back then oil was a volatile commodity and the first nuclear power plants came online basically just in time to save taiwan's bacon because the price of oil was going up many times over the course of uh the 70s and 80s we ended up building uh six nuclear reactors which accounted for half our grid basically half our power we also had with a good bit of hydro. The rest, of course, is still hydrocarbons because uh, Taiwan is pretty much energy poor. Every single molecule of hydrocarbons from coal to natural gas have to ship be shipped onto the island. This is what we use. We use nuclear, we use a little bit of hydro. The rest is imported coal and later on, and so still some oil and some gas. As our grid grew, um, we stayed pretty much with the six reactors, so they diminished in importance while we ended up just burning more coal, more gas. Taiwan's attempt at an energy transition really began in earnest when President Tsai took office in 2016. She ran on a platform of phasing out nuclear energy for good by 2025 was her target. And the reason she did this was Taiwan, of course, was an authoritarian country for a long time. And all the nuclear power plants were built under the dictator Chiang Kai-shek and uh, the opposition DPP, which is in power right now. But back then, they were vehemently anti-nuclear power because they associated it with Chernobyl, of course, but also with the dictator who built all those plants. and they decided to shut them all down. So Tsai uh, decided that she would replace all that nuclear energy with renewable power. And uh, back in those days, nuclear was already a pretty low proportion of the mix, around 12%. Meanwhile, uh, we were just burning so much coal back in 2016, 46% coal. I believe it's 32% gas. We were still burning 5% oil. All the renewable energies, such as solar photovoltaic, biomass, and wind, were under a single percent, and we, we had maybe two and a half percent of hydro. She set a bold vision for 2025 to phase out nuclear energy, to increase renewable energy to 20 percent, to increase natural gas to 50 percent, and to have coal go down to 30 percent. That was her big energy promise when she came into office all those years ago. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because the choice for renewable energy was to replace nuclear, not, let's say, phase out coal, right? So as you, you're highlighting here, the decisions behind that were more political, also 
of Fukushima had happened and so forth and following trends set in Germany, for example. But it's just interesting, isn't it? The lens clearly wasn't decarbonisation, you know, which you would just go after, OK, well, let's remove oil first and then we'll remove coal and then, you know, etc. It's just it's fascinating, that sort of dynamic, which is one that has played out globally to some extent, that the, 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 the revulsion against nuclear is not necessarily grounded in, in facts and decarbonisation, but other other associated attributes um could just before we sort of move on to the mix today how is the energy mar- how are the energy markets in taiwan organized are we talking about a liberalized regime or is there a, a state monopolies running power production and, and distribution it's definitely a state monopoly um very much in the mold of like the old scom or uh edf very much a uh, state power monopoly and uh, it's only gotten very little liberalized around the edges in recent years and uh, power stability was its mandate and uh, for many many decades Thai Power uh, the Taiwan Power Company did a very good job of that and where where was the coal and gas in particular coming from a lot of the coal comes from Australia and also other coal producing companies and Thai Power, this is a strong technocratic organization. We actually like form teams and we actually own some coal mines in Australia, I believe, and we do oil exploration. And in terms of gas, we do a lot of long term contracts, Qatar, Australia, they're all in the mix. We used to buy gas from Russia as well, but that contract has stopped. We don't buy any from the U.S., funnily enough, but otherwise, yeah, it is sourced globally, both the coal and the gas. So so let's continue the story of that renewable policy. What renewables were they leaning on in particular and and how did that policy progress trying to remove nuclear? Well, um, I think President Tsai had a very idealistic vision of how to reach this 20% of renewables. And um, growth in solar has gone from 1% to of the mix, less than 1% when she took office, to around 4% now. But unfortunately, it's running into land use snags because Taiwan is a very tiny country. We're talking about, you can take high-speed rail, from Taipei, which is on the north end of the island, you can take it all the way to Kaohsiung on the south end of the island. It's a two hour trip. Plus, uh, central Taiwan is very mountainous. This means that land use conflict becomes quite inevitable. Uh, the Council of Agriculture have decided that it's uh, not going to allow large scale solar farms on farmland. And um, the rest of the land, it's also extremely expensive. So now you have the latest FIT for solar in Taiwan for 2022. It's maybe about 16 to 19 US cents. Compare that to rooftop solar in California, that's maybe seven cents or even much cheaper. I think there's a solar project in Abu Dhabi that's like one one and a half cents per kilowatt hours. Solar just becomes so expensive and lim- kind of, unless we decide it's okay to use farmland, it's, it's kind of getting mature. The big hope in terms of volume is offshore wind, because of course, with offshore wind, there's much less in terms of land use conflict. You can go into the ocean and the Taiwan Straits on the Western side of the island actually has excellent wind speed. And uh, we're really counting on that to provide some volume to help us reach our renewable goals. The goal was to install 5.5 gigawatts in the water by 2025. We're going to miss that goal for a lot of reasons. But um, offshore wind is still what we hope would provide a lot of renewable energy for Taiwan, which is so important for the continued success of our tech companies. Because one thing that I don't think we've mentioned yet is that companies like TSMC, they don't just need power, they need green power because they've made 
well, actually companies like Apple and Microsoft and Google and Facebook have made commitments to use low carbon power. So before we move on to today's the scenario today and the, the, the grid shutdowns and, and energy management that Taiwan is facing. Can you just, I, you know, I, you spend a lot of your time and are a proponent of offshore wind. Can you tell us how, how they managed to scale to where they did, but also why they, they missed those expectations? There's a lot to be proud of when you look at Taiwan's development in offshore wind, because we started off when President Tsai took office in 2016, basically with nothing. And um, because she gave very clear and um, very large scale policy directions, we attracted a bunch of global developers, let's say from Europe, I said, trying to expand to global market. So right now we can proudly say Taiwan is first in non-China Asia when it comes to offshore wind development. And um, yeah, we have, we have about a gigawatt of offshore wind farms spinning and that energy is so sorely needed for our tech supply chain. Increasingly, they don't just need any old power, they need renewable energy. They need this for supply chain reasons because big customers like Apple and Google and Microsoft are demanding low carbon energy for to make their products. So um, all that is to the good, but unfortunately, there were also mistakes made when it comes to this industry development. The Thai government decided that they were going to impose quite heavy local content requirements, which means that developers were obligated to buy a lot of components, source a lot of components from here in Taiwan. And these are very, very difficult learning curve to make these blades, to make these towers, to make these giant foundations. And they were not necessarily well suited to Taiwan's economy. As a result, Taiwan's wind farms are also the most expensive uh, offshore wind farms in the world, unfortunately. And of course, I think your global listenership might know that offshore wind ever since the Russia-Ukraine war has run into some unfortunate turmoil. Uh, first of all, the commodity prices have gone insane. They weren't used to it. They weren't prepared for it. They weren't hedged. Uh, and we're talking about raw material prices going up uh, 40%, more than that. We're no longer in a zero interest rate environment, which is very, very deleterious for achieving financial close on these mega projects. So um, offshore wind in Taiwan, as in the rest of the world, is somewhat at a crossroads and uh, the future is uncertain. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. That in and of itself is a very fascinating story and rolls across the energy transition as well. Costs are indeed going up, supply chains are stressed, etc. So let's let's bring it up to the present day. Taiwan is experiencing outages, blackouts, which is having an enormous impact on obviously TSMC and the economy more broadly, but also on people and we're coming up to an election. Where for President size replacement, what is the current mix today? And, and can you give us a sort of an overview of the current situation? Where has energy policy fallen short or expectations not been met that has led us to this situation? Paul, let us roll back a little bit. I feel like the situation is bad, but it's not as dire as you say. We are not South Africa. We basically have a stable grid that is working day in and day out. But also, ever since I've been covering energy here in Taiwan, which is just since 2020, we've suffered three island-wide rolling blackouts, and that is highly concerning and irregular. 
on a day-to-day -day basis, I would say the grid has been fragilized and there are what I would call some interesting demand response going on. What I mean is Thai Power would call a factory in the middle of the afternoon and say, we're cutting it really close for the evening peak today. Can you shut off some of your production? Let me tell you, if you are a factory owner, you do not want to get that call at all. Um, Thai Power does compensate you a little bit for not using that power and saving the grid, but it's nothing compared to the losses you experience from having to shut down your production. And about half of the power in Taiwan is used towards manufacturing and other business production. So it's very hard for us to tighten our belts and use less power in order to overcome a power crunch. Because uh, let's say you use green buildings or whatever, the residential use is, is only about 20 to 30%, the rest commercial, and then 50% is manufacturing. That means when you cut down on power use, you're directly impinging on your economic growth. I would say that the status of the grid in Taiwan is precarious. It is tight. Unfortunately, despite the fact that it's tight, we've hardly made any progress at all in decarbonization since President Tsai took over. Because yes, she went in big, both for solar and offshore wind. We've increased solar to maybe 4% of the grid. Wind is coming up more slowly, it's still under 2%. But okay, we increased renewables. Uh, but at the same time, we've been closing reactors. So if you look at the proportion of our grid that is low carbon energy, that stayed almost exactly flat. It was 16.2% when she came into power. Now it's 16.4% for 2022, which is the latest year we have data for. This is from a great website called lowcarbonpower.com. Um, the rest of the grid also, unfortunately, hasn't changed that much. The good thing is we don't burn oil anymore. That was about 5% of the grid when she took over. So we burn a little bit more gas. So we burn a little bit more gas. Okay, gas is at 39% now. I think it's it's up from 32 or 33% when she took power and we don't burn oil anymore. Coal is down, but only by a tiny percentage. It was 46% when she took power. For 2022, it's 43%. So I feel like we've done a lot of work towards pushing renewables. We spent a lot of money. We offered very generous feeding tariffs for solar and for the first couple of phases of offshore wind production. And for what? We, we, our grid is basically, in terms of carbon, it's exactly in the same place. Why are there the energy, the load problems? Is this simply that you've I don't in any way want to sort of fall in the camp of anti-renewables whatsoever, but is this you've replaced base load power providing nukes with renewables who which are intermittent? Is that is that the fundamental sort of mismatch there that's causing, you know, Thai power to phone up factories and say, Hey, you need to dial off this evening? Actually, I don't think so. Sure, intermittency is a problem. But intermittency tends to be a problem more when there are higher penetration. So at 4% solar and what is it, 2%-ish wind or 1.24%. Okay, even lower than I thought. I, I don't think they're that much of a problem yet. The problems is more like, first of all, we have um, coal plants that are aging and we cannot build any more. And a good thing too, but it's not just, it's considered no longer acceptable to put a new coal asset onto the grid because you know they're 50 year assets. So we can't build more, but our fleet is aging. Gas, we pretty much maxed out as much as we can without putting in more receiving terminals. That's the cap. So you know, it's, it's pretty hot now in the summer. The tanks in Taiwan can only hold like eight days worth of gas. 
we're waiting on another receiving terminal, but even when that comes online, we're still going to be very short on receiving capacity. So um, shutting off the nuclear plants doesn't help. Certainly the fact that the um, fourth nuclear power plant, which was planned, you know, energy capacities planned years in advance, the fact that they were never put into service, that didn't help. I would say it's unfair to blame renewables on the current state of Taiwan's power a power crunch. I think it's it's really mostly the nuclear phase out policy and also um, an over reliance on gas. Just because I think it is consequential, what is the current state of those nukes? They are they're, for various reasons, as I understand it from our previous discussions, these aren't completely deactivated, right? Yeah, it's an interesting story, actually. Uh, first of all, we do have two reactors going now and where there's hope for if the policy change. Let's, let's not forget, we're still on track to phase out nuclear energy completely by 2025. But um, those two reactors can get a life extension and continue for another 20, 40 years. What's interesting is that the reactors that are already idled, they never got decommissioned because there was a political tussle over where to put the nuclear uh, spent fuel rods. So because there was a political tussle over where they should go, they just stayed where they were. So they stayed in the wet storage on the nuclear power plant area. And then the last batch of fuel rods actually is still remaining in the reactor. This meant that it was impossible to dismantle the nuclear island for decommissioning. In theory, all of Taiwan's nuclear reactors can be either um, restarted or unmothballed. And if, if that's the case, we're at least out of our power crunch for a decade or so. Um, it would be about 20% of our grid um, versus 0% if we let them all go. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to return to where that stands in the upcoming election shortly. I think you've really helped me understand kind of the, the, the current scenario. Then we layer back in China and geostrategic politics and, and, and security. And the real challenge, of course, is that some, you know, the vast majority of of Taiwan's power, adding it up, right, so some, you know, whatever it is, 70% or so, is imported, whether it's gas or coal. And that is a real challenge when it comes to blockades. Yes. And that, of course, is what China has been practicing a couple of times in maneuvers off the Straits of Taiwan and so forth. Can you just help us understand all of this? Like, you know, you've mentioned as well that there's only eight days worth of, of gas storage. I mean, this would have profound consequences, right? Can you talk about the blockade? Energy as a national security issue for Taiwan is really tied to the fact that we're planning to increase our percentage of natural gas gas use up to 50%. The decision to use so much natural gas has already cost us dearly because the cost of LNG, of course, have been crazy since the Russia-Ukraine war. But an another issue is that LNG is super chilled and comes to Taiwan in these tankers that are exceedingly fragile. Like They, they actually get wide berth when they're just uh, traveling normally. But the fear is that if China decide to stop them from coming in, then Taiwan is not going to have a lot of energy to be able to hold out in a blockade situation. The fortunate thing about Taiwan in the case of a possible war is that our geography is fabulously defensible. We are an island and we know exactly which beaches the Chinese are gonna come in from if they decide to do a full-on amphibious assault. And they won't be able to land their vessels right on their beaches. Uh, they'll have to use smaller crafts. And then you have individuals weighted down with, you know, it's, it's like, if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, right? So that kind of a situation, except we'll know exactly where they're coming. And we have those machine guns in position and we've been doing those uh, drills for time out of mind. Yeah. But 
I think the the newer idea is that China might try something that's more like a blockade, in which case our ability to hold out for quite a period of time becomes important. Find this sort of terrifying and fascinating. There's this, also this idea that you described to me of a ghost blockade. Can you help us understand that? For a long time, I assumed. That in order to have a blockade, you China will need to actually muster up the vessels, the muscle, to police the Taiwan Strait in such a way that to, to actually block the vessels from coming in. But interesting things happened last year when Nancy Pelosi came to visit. China did some very intense military exercises where they designated six areas all around the island of Taiwan, where basically they said missiles might fall out of the sky. In fact, they did fire some missiles that went all the way over Taiwan and into the ocean on the other side. What's interesting is that even though the exercises were only for a few days. They had a definite effect on commercial traffic, because of course, if if you have a highly valuable commercial vessel, you don't want to be anywhere near the area of those exercises and those six areas encircle Taiwan. So、um, this really got people thinking. Well, if they ever just declare that they were doing military exercises all around Taiwan, what would that do to The commercial traffic coming in and out of Taiwan, it, it it might be less intense than a blockade because let's remember a blockade is an act of war, but if they simply say, oh, we're just doing permanent military exercises and just be careful, <laughs> I think it would have a a huge effect on whether or not commercial traffic will be willing to traverse those waters. It might be willing, but you can't get insured, right? That's the issue. Like, if actually these cargoes cannot get insured, they're not coming anyway, right? That's sort of the the hardwired element of this. Yeah, and to me, the fear is that way they can、um, use it as an excuse to say it's not a blockade, it's not an act of war, and the reason why that make might make a difference is. It might be more difficult for the United States to rally the troops and say, "Let's come to Taiwan's aid." But what is China doing? China isn't doing anything. It's it's just military exercises. So、um, to me, that is like the classic kind of gray zone tactic. That it's, it's, it's a creative way of、um, putting pressure on Taiwan without escalating all the way to war. As、uh, as Chris Miller said, you know. Uh, authoritarian governments don't necessarily index the GDP. I mean, this would have profound consequences again on the global supply chain for semiconductors and all else as well, and and obviously the people of Taiwan. But it doesn't, even though it sounds entirely irrational, it doesn't mean it it couldn't happen, which is the the scary thing about this. Okay, so let's let's just one thing. I I don't think we've nailed this. I I my my apologies. What is the You know how how expensive is power in Taiwan for your average consumer today, and and how have those prices fared over the last three years? Oh my goodness, this is another huge problem. I can just keep going on about this. The truth of the matter is, power in Taiwan is too cheap, and it has always been too cheap. Even back in the in the time of、uh, Chiang Kai Shek, you know, like he kept the power price of power down too, as a kind of like a You know, even authoritarians. You know, they need to keep the people on side. So it it was、uh, what he did. We kept power cheap.、Um, our government is keeping power cheap too. It's like two point something Taiwan dollars per kilowatt hour. I can't do the conversion inside my head right now, but it's like one of the cheapest in Asia. And it's just like we don't produce any hydrocarbons. We have no business charging. Such a low price for power, and guess what? After the war in Ukraine, the price of natural gas, of course, right? It it went crazy. We actually we have a price board to set the price of the power.、Uh, we actually kept the price of power almost flat. So what happens is the state-run Taiwan Power Company just took on 
absolutely huge losses, nauseating losses, and it would have gone bankrupt, except, of course, um, it got a cash infusion from the government. Mm. So it's backed by the government, but that's ultimately taxpayer money. And I worry so much about this because it shows a profound lack of seriousness on the part of the government to actually take care of the problem. That's another problem with natural gas. The price is so volatile. There's so many sort of echoes of what's happened with Germany. The same set of scenarios, removing the nukes, and then actually the hydrocarbon flows being at risk. In this case, they were coming from, you know, an authoritarian regime and you had the Ukraine war and exactly the same thing has played out. You know, the government backstopping this, but that's a, we have covered that and that's a separate story. Okay, so we're coming up to an election, January 2024. We're recording this in very, very late August, the last gasp of summer, hopefully, if you're in the US. Where do the, the two different parties, the DPP and the KMT, stand on energy policy and how, how high up the, the chain of priorities is it? Uh, it's actually gotten a bit more complicated than that, Paul, because we have the DPP, the ruling party, the KMT in opposition, but there's now a third party called Taiwan People's Party. Uh, and they've searched... Is this the Foxconn? No, that's... <laughs> so, I'm, I hate to do it to you. Um, let's just call it Lai Qingde, <laughs> who is the current vice president right now, and the three little pigs. <laughs> and the, the reason I call them the three little pigs, because that's what Terry Guo calls themselves, like, you know... And like, oh, you better all come to my house because otherwise we're, we're, we're all going to be lost. Basically, they're splitting each other's votes. So uh, currently, unless they all consolidate under one leader, neither the KMT, TPP, or Terry Guo, who's coming out as an independent, they don't have a chance against the DPP candidate, Lai Qingde, who's currently the vice president. I don't even know if I want to discuss them because they're they're currently like a, a sideshow right now. But the problem for Lai is, even though he can probably just waltz into the presidency uh, next year, he's still facing with a bit of a mess when it comes to the energy policy, right? He's um, going to have to clean up a pretty serious situation or else Taiwan will see persistent blackouts on his watch. So I personally hope that he will be more serious uh, about energy policy going forward. What is the policy debate? Is there discussions around this can't go on, energy security is critical, and the nukes must be turned back on, as that's our real only indigenous or autochthonous way of producing power without being beholden to blockades, etc.? We are still going to be vulnerable to blockades, even if we do turn the nukes on, because it's the natural gas that's the problem. And that's still going to be a huge part of our grid. But the nukes might might help us out a lot. And more moreover, it's like an overall power crunch situation. They will help us a lot for that. If the Vice President Lai Qingde does succeed, President Tsai Ing-wen, then he's going to have a serious decision to make about whether or not he's going to re- reverse her signature policy, one that she pretty much ran on um, in 2016 to come to power, which is for Taiwan to be a no nuclear homeland. The thing is, I don't think he's willing to say so boldly before he's elected. The closest he's come is that he said, when somebody did ask him what would happen to Taiwan um, in the case of an energy blockade, he did mention nuclear power as a um, source of emergency energy, even as he still um, agrees to the no nuclear homeland policy. This is nonsense. You can't have idle nukes as an emergency source of energy. It doesn't work. I like to think that he. it shows, though, that he's keeping an open mind about whether or not the nuclear power plants should at least uh, be kept in the back pocket as an option. Wrapping it up, you spent your career so far focusing on Taiwan's energy sector, both as a reporter and an analyst. Obviously, a, a significant amount of that has been focused on the renewable side, and you've really 
you it really espoused for us you know some of the challenges there and and actually but also some of the the real successes when you sort of step back kind of what do you think the lessons are or the the key themes that we should all take away from from this discussion i mean you know where could taiwan be and where should it be and and you know and what lessons are there there i think there was way too much wishful thinking when it comes to setting the direction of her policy when President Tsai took over. I think it is absolutely fatal to rely on hopes and dreams and projections when it comes to something as important as your energy policy. I think if her team had actually done a proper audit of how much renewable resources there, in tai- there is in Taiwan, they would have had a more more reasonable expectations of how quickly we can grow those energy sources. And I think they would have very clearly seen that it's good to keep those nuclear power plants going at least until they can expand renewable energy to such a state that the overall power supply is not in doubt. I am still a believer in renewable energy. Of course I am. I think there's tremendous, um, I hope that offshore wind gets over this current bout of a high price crisis and um, there's definitely more volume there. I think Taiwan can probably afford to use a little bit of farmland, a little bit more farmland for solar farms. I think it's a trade-off, it's a tough political battle that needs to be fought. And maybe advanced geothermal that you know, starting to hear about. Maybe those will finally come through. I don't know. But the problem is until your renewable energy start working for your grid and you've gotten rid of your dirtiest coal and maybe you've done at least gotten rid of half your gas, don't touch the nukes. Don't touch the nukes until you've gotten rid of your coal. I think if everybody just did that, so many countries will not be in a world of hurt right now like Taiwan is. Yeah, it's to pay off your highest interest rate credit card first, right? You know, and uh, and coal is definitely that. That's a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, pay pay off your, your biggest source of problems. Don't don't many, make any crypto investments <laughs> until your credit cards are paid Well, don't off. make any crypto investments as we've got uh, Zeke Fo coming up. And uh, yeah, there's another Ooh. shocking tale. OK, well, Angelica, it's been absolutely... I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating. I'm sure people can find you on LinkedIn. We can put um, links in the show notes to your publications. And look, I, I really hope that we can we can have you back on in a, a year or so. And there has been no change, uh, you know, or at least only positive changes, um, you know. And but it's been a fascinating insight. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All the way crossed. Thank you, Paul. I love your podcast. So it's been a delight. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.